thought it was going to be some kind of like crazy vacation where suddenly I was like running through the streets, mm. you know, buying handbags and new dogs or whatever. But obviously, um, it's much more complicated than that. I loved making the show. It wasn't just an amazing creative experience. It also acted as a guard from a lot of aspects of life. I was always working on it. I was always surrounded by like-minded people. And so re-entering the world, especially in a year like this, has definitely been a little bit of a shock. Mm-hmm. So I'm feeling um, excited and trepidatious about not knowing what is next. We always thought we would end it at five seasons. I don't know why. Like I think we thought that was like a really elegant Mm. amount or something Mm -hmm. and um, in season four Mike Lombardo who's running HBO at the time said don't you think you have at least two more years Mm. in you and we said yeah I think we do and that actually helped our writing process a lot Mm. not everyone is so lucky to get to know when they're going to end and I think it gave us an arrow that we were pointing to and I think one of the reasons people responded so positively to season five is because we really had this drive because we knew what we were setting up I mean, the thing that oh, that surprises me and I'm so grateful for is that people are still talking about it. Mm. I think it's so rare to be in the sixth season of a show and people are still writing about it in mm. the New York Times and mm-hmm. still engaged and passionate about it. And there are lovers and haters, but they're both really passionate. And mm-hmm. so I feel like we're really lucky that we're still touching a nerve. And that surprised me. It Mm. surprised me from day one, and it continues to surprise me. Mm. And also, I can never, ever see coming what people will respond to (laughs) and why. I never know. Like, I'm always shocked by what people are upset with or find hilarious. You know, when we had the Sherry Appleby scene Mm. where she crawled across the floor, and it was kind of a dark sex scene, and I always knew it was like a dark kind of gray area, but people were really questioning the consent of it all. And that surprised me because that wasn't our intention. Aren't you glad I didn't let you throw away that halter top collection after you read the How to Clean Up Like a Japanese Person book? Literally so relieved you're an amazing friend. So, because I am such an amazing friend and I am so respectful of your space, I wanted to ask you personally if I could use your room while you're away. What for? Just a teeny tiny little orgy. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Oh my God, how many people even come to an orgy? We never really discuss politics in an overt way on girls. It almost exists in a world that's like running slightly parallel to politics. Like it doesn't quite date itself. We're not exactly sure. I mean, it's happening now, but we never say, you know, it is April 2015. Like we mm-hmm. really, we really talk, try to think about it as its own universe. But I think that the show because it's about women and because it's about imperfect and messy women who want to have control over their own bodies and their own lives, um, it has an inherently political angle, and we definitely didn't shy away from that. And I'm sure some of the sort of, you know, the tide of misogyny that we were seeing really finally rear its head in America definitely had to make its way into what we were writing, even if it wasn't in an overt way. I, I do think that you we wouldn't make girls today. Mm. I think it's a really different world. It was like a really Obama world when we mm-hmm. started and it was a lot more optimistic than it is now and mm-hmm. and people looking inward that much mm-hmm. was something that we had a lot more freedom to laugh at then mm-hmm. um, so I don't think I don't think it's necessarily become less relevant but I don't don't think we could do it today I don't know how TV itself should respond like part of me just wants to make silly silly work so Mm. people can laugh and then part of me wants to like maybe do a show set in the Reagan era so you can talk about it but not really talk about it. Mm. I don't know. I think the most important thing that we can do in television is raise up the voices of really diverse creators. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful thing to have shows that depict diversity but really making sure that we let all different kinds of people tell their stories on television is how we normalize people and how we let everyone across the country know that whether you're Islamic whether you're transgender, whether you're, you know, uh, handicapped in some way, your reality is as true and real and necessary as anybody else's. And I think that's the power of TV to change hearts and minds. Jenny and I have both said, like, we definitely don't want to make another show with four white girls on the poster. And obviously it's been seven years. I started when I barely understood what Hollywood was and I barely knew anyone would be seeing the show. And I've really appreciated the conversation around diversity and really appreciated the feedback I've gotten. I think the thing that's challenging is that once people make a decision about you and who they think you are, they very often don't want to let you grow. So whether you've internalized criticism or made shifts to your show or 
you know, Jenny and I created Lenny because we understood that the systems that have lifted us up, we needed to be a part of systems lifting other women's diverse, women's diverse voices up. But there are a lot of people who won't necessarily engage with that work because they made a decision based on the first season of Girls because we aren't used to letting people in the public eye evolve. But I feel really lucky to have been given the gift of knowledge and the chance to evolve. I mean, Lenny Lighter, we just made our deal that we can start expanding to videos, so mm. that's going to be really interesting. We're trying to grow that, and we have a book imprint for mm -hmm. Lenny Letter. We have a book coming out by Jenny Zhang, and um, we have a few things in development at HBO, but I don't know, like, which one will come first. Paddle, paddle, paddle. It's good. Okay, that's enough paddling. And then hands on the rails. Okay, now the wave comes. We're gonna push up into a standing position. One, two, three. Up. Pop up. Okay, that's not bad. Fuck. Shit, you okay? Fuck, no, I'm not Anyone? okay. No, I'm not okay. It's my front arm. Which arm is the front? This front okay. of this arm is really injured. Okay, let me look. Look okay, there's no grazes or anything. Well, it's an internal injury, so obviously you're not gonna see anything. Uh huh. You know what? You'd be surprised. I've fallen over right. on concrete. You'll be okay. The sand is a very forgiving surface. Yeah, so okay. Why don't we get you back up? What am I going to do when I'm out in the water and I only have one arm? Um, okay, Teo, why don't we get her up to Nurse Laura? Yeah. yeah. See if she can get taken care of. You okay? It would be yeah. my honor. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Riz was just, I mean, we cast him right in the middle of the airing of the night out, you know, right mm. after it, I think. And um, we were just crazy for him. And someone had told us he was really funny. Mm. and someone we trusted, and so it just seemed perfect. It was fun to write that women subplot because I loved the idea that, like, we've somehow made feminism um, corporate, and the idea that we've made sort of, the, we've, femi we've taken feminism, which is a very specific political movement, and made it about issues like networking and money, and of course there's a really valid place for conversations about women in the workplace. That's what Sheryl Sandberg and Anne-Marie Slaughter are doing so well in their books, but it is funny when we sort of take femi feminism and girl power and make them into sort of merchandise. I think the Spice Girls did it better the first time. I've always really rejected the idea that, and I don't mean this in a combative way, but I've always really rejected the notion that Hannah's one of the most hateable people on television. We have so many male characters who literally commit murders, cheat on their wives, and start drug rings and are considered sort of joyful anti-heroes. Vague selfishness and an inability to commit to a relationship does not a villain make. And I think that Hannah is growing and changing like the rest of us. But um, it's, it's not Hannah's fault that we live in a society where problematic, where problematic and challenging women are, you know, treated like they belong in a detention center. You know, the end for Hannah is something that Lena has seen since second season, mm. I want to say. Um, and, I mean, it's just about, the season is really about, like, them trying to grow up and what that means and where they'll all settle. And the premise of the show has always been so much about, like, are these the friends you keep for your life? Mm. And just because you end up, like, as their roommates or whatever. And I think Shoshana is the first to kind of tell them all what idiots they are. Yeah. Um, but, uh, so it's, it's sort of about... I think that we wrap up their stories. I'm just don't think we necessarily do it in a way that um, is always positive. Mm -hmm. Like we wrap it up like life, like some people yeah. are doing great and some people aren't. What's next? What is next for me? <laughs> um, I'm working on a book of fiction. So um, that's something that I'm doing. I'm working on a book of fiction, which I'm incredibly excited about. That comes out in early 2018. We're continuing to expand Lenny and the mission of Lenny and to um, gather forces around that. And then um, Jenny and I have a few television and film projects we're developing. And then obviously this is a year to be hands-on as an activist and a citizen and to find the ways that you can be most useful. So that's what I'm looking forward to with some naps thrown in. <laughs>